a very happy new year and a very warm welcome to each one of you for joining us online on this cold winter morning, afternoon, evening, depending upon where you are joining us from in the Asia Pacific region. Welcome to this very topical session on youth and online gender-based violence, challenges and solutions. This session is also being live streamed on Facebook pages of CNS and Gender Equality Talks, links of which will be shared with you in the chat box. And you are welcome to show some love, like, share and comment. Some quick housekeeping announcements. Participants, please keep yourself muted throughout the session. You can type in your queries and comments in the chat box as the session progresses. We will take them up at the end of the discussion. Friends, as we all know, with the increasing accessibility of internet and social media platforms, many of our real life activities have started taking place in the online public sphere. Virtual spaces have become a convenient place to share opinions, exchange ideas, increase our knowledge, and find entertainment also without even stepping out of our homes. But alas, the internet is like a double-edged sword, especially for women and girls. While it provides vital spaces for women seeking expression and opportunities, it is also being used as an instrument by abusers to target women. Online gender-based violence, or OGBV as we call it, is casting a long oppressive shadow on the freedom and safety of women, girls, and gender diverse individuals globally. And the Asia Pacific region is no exception. According to one study, the prevalence of OGBB in the Asia Pacific was as high as 88% in 2021, with girls and women and those from vulnerable backgrounds disproportionately affected. Also, the impact of gender-based violence committed in the virtual space is increasingly spilling over into offline spaces, sometimes with severe consequences. Today, we will go together through three equally important sessions on this topic. The first session features those youth, youth leaders who are part of the youth team that has not only dived deep into understanding the problem of online gender-based violence, but also collectively developed a powerful toolkit to address it. The second session will feature insights from media, very senior media leaders who have reported on gender justice from across the Asia Pacific region. The third session will feature remarks from peer youth leaders and this will be followed by a discussion space for comments, reflections, and questions from the participants. Without any further ado, let us hear from youth leaders and media professionals on various aspects and impacts of online gender-based violence. I would like to welcome three firebrand youth leaders who are also members of the 30 for 2030 network hosted by UN Women Asia Pacific to spearhead today's discussion. We are indeed honored to have with us Hafsa Mohit from Sri Lanka, Kirti Jayakumar from India, and Tanmaya Sagar from India. Tanmaya will be joining us soon. She is writing an exam right now, so she'll be here very soon. Hafsa Mohit is an intersectional feminist, human rights advocate from Sri Lanka, with over eight years of grassroots experience specializing in cross-sectoral solutions. She is the founder of Amplifying Impact, a youth-led feminist organization working to support vulnerable and marginalized groups. She was a director at Sri Lanka Unites, a national youth movement focusing on reconciliation and peace building. Hafsa is also a core team member at Youth Advocacy Network Sri Lanka and a Women Deliver Young Leader alumni. Kirti Jayakumar is a women's rights activist, a researcher, a peace educator, lawyer, 
and writer all rolled into one. She works in the women, peace, security, feminist foreign policy, and decolonial justice spaces. She founded and runs the Gender Security Project and is the head of community engagement at World Pulse. She also founded the Red Elephant Foundation, an initiative built on storytelling, civilian peace building, and activism for gender equality. Kirti has coded Sahas, a mobile app and chatbot to help survivors of gender-based violence. She's a Commonwealth scholar, a Vital Voices Lead Fellow, a Local Pathways Fellow, and a World Pulse Impact Leader. Tanmaya Shir Sagar is an Indian classical vocalist, writer, and academic, and an intersectional feminist for gender equality and empowerment in the field of art and music. A recipient of the National Scholarship in Music by the Government of India, she has been a performing artist since 2016. Tanmaya has worked with various national and international companies as a B2B and features writer. She has also been the campaign co-lead for the 16 days of activism against online gender-based violence. Welcome Hafsa, Kirti and Tanmaya. Hafsa, can you please elaborate upon what different forms and types of violence against women and girls are taking place in the virtual space? Right. Thank you, Shobha, first for the warm welcome and for having me here. It's truly a pleasure and a privilege. I think uh, first, thank you for setting the tone to understand why we it's a gendered issue as well. So Shobha, thank you for that. So there are different forms of violence. First, I want to just uh, give a little small introduction to the definition of online gender-based violence, or sometimes you would have heard the word tech facilitated OGBV or online gender-based violence, which is violence that is amplified using technology. Even though it is done using technology, it can also manifest in the offline world, right? And it can start offline and migrate to online or vice versa. Now, unlike usual forms of gender-based violence, online gender-based violence or technology-facilitated gender-based violence, known as TFGBV, has forms and there are emerging forms because the tech landscapes keeps changing. Right? So I'm going to take you all through a few different forms. The first one is cyber flashing. It's basically the act of sending unsolicited photographs of genitalia or sexual acts with the intent of silencing a person or an individual. And people are usually targeted for their sex, gender or sexual orientation. The next form I would like to highlight is digital voyeurism. This actually is about filming, watching or sharing online films or videos of people's bodies through live or pre-recorded videos. It can actually happen through hidden cameras in spaces that you can't even imagine and objects or stolen photographs. And these are disseminated without their consent. Sometimes these are deep fake. They are created fakely and uh, imposed on into online images. So these are produced from such acts known as creep shots. Okay. So another one form is cyber stalking. It's a very common form. It's actually where you surveil or monitor a person through digital technology. And it helps uh, or it's usually done to prevent victims from escaping abuse situations like domestic violence. Another form is doxing. Doxing is basically where you disclose personal information online with malicious suggestions for other person to contact the person targeted to causing more harm. For example, if somebody reveals my personal address, uh, where I work, with addresses, locations, my date of birth online with in groups that are not considered safe, or my personal phone number without my consent, uh, that is called doxy. Other one is gender-based hate speech. This is where you have harmful, hateful, demeaning comments and shaming statements done targeting a person's sex, gender, or sexual orientation and can include comments that shows talking about a person's that they deserve to face harm or they should harm themselves. We see this uh, highly across social media. Another form of online gender-based violence is identity theft or impersonation or we say creation of fake profiles. I think in this call, if I ask you all to show a raise of hands, 
uh, how many of you or do you know people who has you know somebody has created a fake profile of you i'm sure we at least know one person or it has happened to us so somebody where they have taken an identity and they act in either humiliating form or a harmful manner or they extort money right another form is called morphing or transmorphication morphing actually refers to where you spice up videos or photographs and you create deep fakes and you upload them onto pornographic sites or platforms where the intention is to actually demean somebody or sexualize somebody with a target another one is non consensual dissemination of intimate photos and videos so that's where sharing of intimate photographs and videos or audios of an individual without consent this is also one of the most reported forms of online gender based violence online grooming is where uh, a relationship is established with the target through the use of internet or any other digital technology where you they want to facilitate online or offline sexual contact with that person another form of online gender based violence is online sexual harassment and bullying so this actually where sexual harassment takes place through internet it can be emailing it can be calls it can be direct messaging through a lot of social media apps right it can be done by a one person or a group of people if it's done by a group of people it's called network harassment another one is online threats and blackmailing so when you do online threats and blackmailing where you threaten somebody or blackmail somebody to share information about an individual it can be images videos to the public to their friends or family and it's mostly targeted towards women and intimidating mostly with the intention of extortion or revenge sometimes these images can be genuine or fake so you can see some of the forms of online violence are interlinked to each other sex exploitation is another form of online gender based violence this actually refers to the commercial exploitation of sexual material or sex via digital media that can be the sale or dissemination of intimate information non consensually uploading videos images audios to pornographic sites installing live streaming feeds unknown to a person and then targeting and selling them as well another one is sex extortion where you refer to extorting sex or sexual favors by threatening to disseminate a person's intimate image or footages of rape zoom bombing occurs when people can join a online gathering to post racist sexist pornographic or anti-semitic content to shock and disturb viewers for example if we are in this call if somebody who is not registered uninvited joins the call and starts typing extremely unwarranted comments on the chat box or drawing on the screen it's called zoom bombing now because of it's because of the online space and actually the rapid acceleration of it there is a lot of emerging forms of online gender based violence one of them is called influencer driven online gender based violence that is where a person who has the ability to influence other people's decision about a particular thing right that is the definition of an influencer when these influencers we are seeing a recent trends where a lot of male influencers are doing or engaging in anti gender initiatives openly i think andrew tate we all know is a very common such influencer then ai based chatbots uh, is also we are seeing a massive increase especially in current world uh, for example when people like ai powered virtual assistants like apple siri or amazon's alexa they respond complacently to inappropriate or abusive language so in a world where ai chatbots are going to be the next biggest thing this is something to be concerned about uh, dating apps is also uh an emerging like there's a lot of forms of lot lot of the above mentioned forms of violence tend to take in place in dating apps so it is very important to consider them as platforms where online gender based violence can emerge i also want to highlight a recent example that happened this will be my final point shobha is in a metaverse where a young girl was raped virtually and i think that was i i'm extremely appalled and disgusted to fact that i even have to share this as an example here firstly uh, secondly is the fact that the people are debating whether it was actually a rape was there an actual harm because it happened in the online space so these are the debates that we are coming into and it's not just the perpetrator the victim the survivor but also other stakeholders how does the media report such an incident are there laws 
uh, support services available to you know should the victim or the survivor should you know pursue justice what are the frameworks available along with emerging forms of violence these are other things that we need to take a look at so i will pause here for now and hand it over to my shobha back so thank you, Hafsa, and thank you for bringing that case up because uh, that was uh, at the back of my mind. And uh, as you said, that people are still debating, but I think the UK government has said that they are going to look into it and take action and uh, formulate laws like uh, they are very proactively following that case. So uh, one more thing, Hafsa, sometimes we talk of, uh, if you can just uh, clarify to our viewers, uh, the difference between what we say tech-based uh, online gender-based violence and tech facilitated violence. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Shobha, for that raising that question. Actually, that's something uh, new that we've come. I mean, working in the grassroots communities, this uh, I must. I want to first highlight that difference or that segmentation of separation comes uh, from through grassroots experience of people doing online gender-based violence. There's not enough data on this. So these are feminist research that consultants through grassroots consultations we have come up with so technology facilitated gender-based violence like i said is where you am it's amplified using technology and that can go to the offline space take based online gender-based violence is where cases where the gender -based violence is completely online and using only the digital space to inflict the violence and unlike usual gender-based violence when we talk about online gender-based violence the number of perpetrators can increase in a few seconds and a few minutes by just clicking and sharing so because of that the consequences of certain attacks or types of forms of violence differ because through an internet someone from a completely different location uh, can cause massive harm only just using a digital medium and to evoke certain responsibility of other stakeholders, feminine, grassroots feminists have decided to categorize it as technology facilitated gender based violence and technology based. For example, what happened at the metaverse, technology based online gender based violence. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hapsa. Thank you. And uh, now you have given us so many different forms of online gender based violence, and sometimes I'm sure many people don't. Uh, even understand or we are not able to differentiate between them. Uh, Kirti, how do these forms of uh, different forms impact and affect people, especially the youth, uh, like gender diverse people, persons with disabilities, women, students, girls? Could you please uh, help us understand that? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this space and for bringing Hafsa, myself and Tanmaya into the space to share with you, Shobha. Really honored to do this today. I want to start by saying that just listening to everything Hafsa brought before all of us, one common strain that really comes to bear is that every individual form is a form of violence that one way or another has some kind of a mirror happening on ground in our offline worlds. So the reason I'm presenting this for you is that so much of what we see happening online is a reflection and a mirroring of what we see happening offline by way of the attitudes and the way we behave with one another as a society. We are a patriarchal society. We are an ableist society. We are a society where there is a dominant narrative and there are excluded several other narratives. And it's because of this dominant narrative that we already have some sort of a normalization of violence. So I want to start by, first of all, naming a few general impacts of OJBV, whether that's tech facilitated or tech based. And then I'll go into some specifics about what individual groups particularly face. So broadly speaking, OJBV has both direct physical and non-physical consequences. On the one hand, the fact that a person is facing violence in itself can lead to their complete erasure from the internet. Because if you've shared an opinion or if you've shared a photograph and somebody has perhaps morphed that photograph or has harassed you for an opinion you have shared, it can put you in a place where you second guess whether you should be in that space at all, to the point that you may even wind up pulling yourself out of that space altogether. Another immediate consequence is, regardless of whether you stay on or off the online space, the fact that an incident happened can produce significant emotional and mental health damages to the point that maybe a person might need extensive therapy or support in the form of a community coming behind them to really rally behind them in ways that help them feel better. 
And that emotional labor falls on the hands of a person with all that energy that could have possibly gone into a creative pursuit or an ambition being diverted towards undoing harm caused to them for no fault of theirs. A third consequence is economic. Now, this is something that happened to me personally. So one of the things that I have done previously is to serve as a liaison for survivors of gender-based violence, which led to the creation of my app. Now, at one point in that journey, I was harassed by a group of people for supporting the rights of a woman in a violent situation. I was harassed so much that I wound up taking myself off of social media platforms for a solid six months. Now, that came with a price because I was also an advocacy officer for an organization, and I simply could not take being in the online environment, which meant that I not only lost a engagement with friends online, but also just had to pull myself out of an economic monetary reward stream that I was relying on. And I had to explain a six-month gap to subsequent employers who were not always in line with understanding what I was facing. Now, these impacts are very real and are likely common across the board. But if you really break this down further, you'll find that some groups are more vulnerable to the adverse impacts and some perhaps not as much, but continue to face some kind of harm. Now, Shobha, you were generous enough to name a few of those groups. I'm going to fall in line with the names that you shared and go group by group with that. Now, starting with sexual orientation, it's one of the common bases on which we see discrimination happening offline. And this largely comes from a patriarchal, heteronormative mindset, which assumes that sex and gender and sexual orientation are deeply binarized, which means that there is no space for anybody who identifies beyond the binary, which in every sense of the term on multiple levels has been proven as perfectly natural. Now, discrimination based on sex, gender or sexual discrimination, sorry, sexual orientation manifests in the form of the language that is used for a person who has perhaps identified beyond binary or whose appearance is perceived as identifying beyond the binary. It manifests in the form of the language that is used to perhaps respond to the posts that they put up. Or sometimes there are even situations where they face violence in their direct messages. In some cases, even the very fact that they are out and proud online has been weaponized against them in job interviews where their presence on a social media platform has been used to either out them in a workplace or to exclude them from a workplace or to perhaps box them in particular contexts, whether it's in a peer group or otherwise. Now, the challenge over here is that several of these forms of violence enjoy free and full play because sometimes offline they exist and live in countries where the law does not recognize their agency or their rights, which means that there is an added advantage to the people who are perpetrating this harm to them because the law does not prohibit this form of harm and this form of harm openly. And this translates perhaps even to the community guidelines on a platform because the guidelines don't particularly provide for the rights of people who identify beyond the binary. So as a consequence, we've also very recently in India noted an incident where a young person who identified beyond the binary actually died by suicide simply because of the harm and hazards they were facing by just existing online. In retrospect, people visited that person's profile, looked at that profile and felt regret but when you really think about it, every day that person was receiving comments and nobody was stepping up to take action to support them. As Anna Frank says, regret is stronger than guilt. And so people wait for that moment of regret and then look back. But that should not be our response, right? Moving further, people with disabilities are equally vulnerable in the online spaces. Now, just think about this very medium you're sitting here with. Your sensory engagement with this is visual. You're seeing me speak to you. And you're listening, which means you're hearing me speak to you. And you have a device which your hands are likely engaging with. Now, this is entirely made for an able-bodied person, a person who's able to see, a person who's able to hear, a person who has hands and is able to use this device. Inherently, that excludes a whole bunch of people because accessibility is the first layer in which violence is experienced by people with disabilities. Now, let's go a bit further. Accessibility has been made available in certain contexts, perhaps there are closed captions, perhaps there are screen readers, perhaps there are other ways to engage using voice without having to use your hands for a device. Let's say a person has been able to access this space. Now, how are the platforms being used? 
In several instances when I've worked with young women, I've received complaints visually impaired and blind girls indicating that there were explicit images and explicit comments being made in their presence on a Zoom call or a Microsoft team call to abuse them, but they simply could not see and their screen reader was turned off because it was a voice call. There are so many instances where Explicit images have been placed in the direct messages and explicit comments have been placed in either a profile picture or in a professional networking site targeting women with visual impairments simply because an enabling environment is provided by an ableist platform. In several cases, community guidelines do not acknowledge, name or even pay any attention to these unique challenges of people with disabilities. And this in itself tells you that the system has been made for the dominant narrative, whether that's patriarchal, heteronormative systems, or able-bodied systems that assume that everybody can access everything easily. Now, in all of these groups, when you look at it in individual senses of the term, the youths are particularly vulnerable. Now, there's an interesting concept in marketing, which, con which, which is called digital age, which means that you could be 40 or 50 offline, but you could probably be 15 offline. And if you're starting out with the internet for the first time, you are equally digitally old. Now, think about what that might mean for people at different ends of the spectrum. When they come into the internet for the first time, they are likely not aware of what they might face. Maybe they're optimistic about the platform. But people who are younger don't have the wisdom or experience of life offline either. And so that vulnerability gets enhanced even more. Young people are subject to so much violence in the form of grooming and predatory behavior online. Perhaps they are subject to abuse even by people at their so same age. And there's an information explosion. I, for one, don't envy younger people because I am just not in a position where I can take that much information all at once without necessarily having the support system. So many young people have access to the internet, but don't have access to support that they need to understand and consume what the internet has to offer. So I'll stop with that, Shobha, and back to you. Shobha, I'm so sorry you're on mute. That's sorry. the fun sorry part of being that. on sorry. mute. Yes, yes, that's the fun part, and that's uh, one of... Uh, you brought about that word about normalization of so many things, that, and that is what is happening, I think, in the case of uh, all sorts of gender-based violences and the societal norms which are expected of, especially of women and girls. And... Uh, 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 different uh, people of uh, different genders uh, and women are often held are accused and held to account on many aspects uh, why why are you on the social media site why do you want to go there why why do you do this all the time we we hear that and if you do that that those will be the repercussions so who is uh, responsible for the repercussions like instead of targeting the perpetrator I often see in our daily lives, it is uh, women and girls who are targeted. They are held to account. And uh, as we have seen, as you have mentioned, what, what it does. And again, I have come up, I feel that sometimes when the physical scar of a violence is seen, then there may be some sort of empathy or sympathy for the person. Most of what you have spoken of and most of what we have experienced, I myself, those are the emotional, psychological st scars and which have which do equally as much harm as maybe a physical assault would do. But a physical assault, all of it, that is wrong. Physical assault seek, sees the attention of other people. What the others we face, that is just buried under the carpet. So that is one thing and that uh, denormalizing those social norms is, I think, very important but i would again come back to you kirti that given that technology based and technology facilitated all forms of online gender based violence is a horrific reality of our times how can we combat it can you please share some useful tips how to deal with them and what is the role of youth in combating them Thank you for asking that, Shobha. It's always helpful and empowering for people to know where they can take action and how they can step up to take action. So I really appreciate this very specific question. Uh, before I say anything, I also want to speak to a point that Shobha brought up, which is going to tie in nicely with what I have to share. Any form of violence, whether that's online, tech-based or tech-facilitated and offline, 
is not the fault of the person who was targeted with that violence. Nobody does anything to earn violence. Absolutely nothing in the world justifies violence. It's the kind of conduct that we should strive to move away from. So it's important for anybody that's thinking about how to combat it to internalize the real truth that we cannot shame victims, whether they are individually ourselves or those around us or people who identify as survivors as well. So having said that, I just want to share with you a few things that you can think about while engaging online, whether it's for yourself or for another. The first thing to remember is to constantly Constantly familiarize yourself with the platforms you're part of. Perhaps you've joined a new social media site or you've been on a social media platform for 10 years. It's always useful to recognize what their community guidelines have to say and they always revise their community guidelines because human conduct forces that change to happen. We're often seeing new forms of violence so it's important for them to also revise those guidelines. So make sure to acquaint yourself with the guidelines. And you can do this before you sign up for a platform so you have an informed decision on whether you feel safe to get on that platform, but even after. And regardless, as long as you're on the platform, just make it a point to do something like your digital housekeeping of reviewing the community guidelines, maybe once every six months or once every year to just understand what resources you have at your disposal to report an incident or address an incident. Now, the second thing that's really useful for you to remember is should an incident happen, the key piece here is that you have agency over an immediate reaction and you have agency over whether you want to take a larger reaction or response to it. So the immediate reaction typically looks like reporting and blocking. Now, you can report an account that has been abusive to you, and this is where knowledge of the community guidelines kicks in because you know that this is reportable on the platform. And if that account is still disturbing, it's difficult to hold on to even looking at that account while you've reported it, you have the freedom to block it. What does blocking do? Most of you already know this, but I'll still say it once again. It basically prevents that person from accessing your presence on that social media platform and interacting with you. However, this doesn't prevent them from creating a new account. So it's important to be vigilant when you block an account so that you can also be aware of a potential modus operandi of trying to move past that block. Now, at the larger level, sort of scaling from the personal to the public, if you will, you also have the option of relying on community. Perhaps somebody has come at you with abusive words or abusive pictures or has been harassing you. You can rely on a group of friends and ask them to also report that account, which will tend to amplify the number of reports that go to the platform. Now, I can't necessarily say that there's a math to this of X number of reports will make the platform take an account down. That's not what happens. It's just that enough number of reports creates critical noise at the back end of the platform where appropriate staff that are positioned to evaluate such accounts can get into it and see if that account has violated the issue, uh, violated the guidelines, and then either take down the account or other appropriate sanctions. You also have the luxury of doing nothing if that feels right. But please remember that regardless of whether you choose to do anything or not do anything is a decision only you get to make for yourself. Nobody should decide this for you and no one can shame you for choosing to do any of these things at any account. In some country contexts, you have the opportunity to go to the police. This really depends on what the laws in your country say. Now, I'm from India and some of the laws in India offer space for reports to be filed. And you also have an online reporting portal, which is for the cyber cell in itself, and a separate one for women themselves to report through the Women and Child Development Ministry. Now, it's useful for you to understand the law, but it can be a lot. I'm a law student and there are lawyers, sorry, 10 years and still counting. But um, as a lawyer, there are some of these provisions that puzzle me, that astound me, and I don't understand it myself. So it can be tricky if you don't have a legal background to unpack these provisions, in which case a useful way to go is to look at civil society. Now, what we've done in our toolkit, which Shobha mentioned, is to map together organizations that are working across the Asia Pacific region on addressing OGV. And what these organizations do are a variety of things. On the one side, you have awareness orientation, where they help break down the law, break down your rights, break down your approaches. And they also help serve as liaisons where you don't have to do the talking to the police or the law enforcement, but they step in to support you. So one useful practice that's, I call this my personal safety audit. And if it's useful for you, try it out yourself. Look at your community guidelines every so often, once in six months, once in a year. List out police helplines and keep them in a place that you can access when you need it. And list out civil society organization helplines that you can rely on if you don't feel like going to the police directly. 
I can't say that this will prevent or inoculate you from online gender-based violence, whether tech-facilitated or tech-based, but it gives you some agency in responding to it should it happen. At all times, it is not your fault, and I'd love for you to know that like the back of your hand. Sorry, Shobha, you're on mute again. Sorry. <laughs> That's the power of the youth to keep on guiding us all the time. <laughs> Kirti, can you tell us something more about the toolkit which you have developed? What is it called and uh, how will it be helpful for the youth and for, for others as well? It's been made by the youth, but uh, how will it help uh, or how can it help uh, combat online gender-based violence? <laughs> Thank you so much for asking, Shobha. I feel like a proud mama, but I'm definitely going to also save space to Hafsa and Tanmaya, who are equal contributors in the development of the toolkit. We came up with the first edition of the toolkit as part of the first cohort of the UN Women's 30 for 2030 network in 2022. And uh, sorry, 2021. Time is such a blur when COVID happens. Folks. I'm so sorry. Uh, but in 2023, the second cohort of which Tanmaya is part had revised and expanded the toolkit. Now this is called the Youth Guide to End Online Gender-Based Violence. While it is for the youth, by the youth, of the youth, and an evolving document that we hope to continue to keep adding on to. So I'd see it as more of a palimpsest rather than a resource, one that just grows and grows with all the challenges we meet and finding strategies to respond to it. We believe that it can help anybody who is online for the first time or online for how many ever time, but is doing a safety audit and wants to find some sense of grounding in how to navigate these spaces. Broadly, our toolkit, as our conversation has showed you today, talks about OGBV, tech facilitated and tech based, explains the impact, explains how you can respond to it, and has very dedicated sections for men and boys who can show up as allies for women and girls and non binary people, the role of the system in itself, whether that's the police, the lawmaker, or platforms. We've also explored strategies for bystander intervention and very specific awareness creation on the impact that it has had on LGBTQIA plus folk, folks with disabilities, and people who are in positions of power to adopt some form of zero tolerance guidelines in their organizational space. Uh, finally, we've also been a bit adventurous here in mapping the possibilities of creating feminist and gender transformative technologies. Um, and the toolkit is available on the UN Women website. We encourage you to, to review it. Yes, we, uh, we have shared the link uh, in the chat box. So we are sharing the link. And uh, thank you, Kirti. And uh, while it is really important to brace oneself and be prepared to counter and fight online gender-based violence as and when it occurs, it is equally crucial and important to have systems and strategies in place to prevent its occurrence in the first place. And that, that is what uh, the uh, ultimate aim is. So Tanmaya, can you please show us the way forward and what could be your recommendations for various stakeholders for preventing online gender-based violence? Yes, Tanmaya, please. Thank you so much, Shobha. And yeah, uh, I hope I'm audible now. Yes. Better? Yes, yes, yes better. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, first of all, a very good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Shobha, for having all of us here. And thank you to CNS for having us. And I should say it's quite a Herculean task to, to talk about the umbrella topic of combating youth and uh, gender-based violence um, uh, and encouraging uh, stakeholder engagement in the field after so my friends here and these truly inspiring women Kirti, Hafsa have talked about their expertise and their stories and uh, such amazing recommendations about the field. But I sure can try. And um, whatever I have to say today stems from my limited experience and a very vast spectrum of perspective built through my work and profound interaction with leaders, advocates for gender equality, generational equality, survivors, entrepreneurs, feminists, and of course, all the people from the 30 for 2030 network of UN women. And they have molded my um, approach and enhanced my approach to gender-based violence and women empowerment uh, on a large scale significantly. Uh, so when I begin to think about uh, the idea of stakeholder engagement, 
uh, and we have a dedicated section to um, the recommendations on stakeholder engagement and how you can get involved in enhancing that uh, in a significant and in a very detailed way in the toolkit that uh, thank you for sharing the link as well. When I think about stakeholder engagement, uh, I stagnate at the word uh, stakeholder. And a stakeholder essentially means an individual concerned with all having interest in something. So before locating it in a corporate or business ended context, which I agree is a major catalyst in shaping uh, probably many avenues in life. Uh, I want to take a moment uh, to dwell on what the word stakeholder is and how it affects our perspective. Because when it comes to gender based violence in any form and in any manifestation, whether it's online, in person, uh, tech facilitated at workplace, in the family, in uh, your educational institute, the stakeholder uh, in the most fundamental uh, sense, the stakeholder is the neighbor next door. Uh, it's your friends, it's your colleague at work, it's the civil society organizations, it's your extended social relationship from your school days, college days, and even um, wherever you have studied, wherever you have worked before, all these people, every single one of us is a stakeholder in a sense. And while we uh, deviate to the concept of investment and strengthening institutions uh, for uh, the purpose of uh, in, uh, creating awareness about gender-based violence, we often fail to uh, gain the insight on the magnitude of how important a uh, role the, these stakeholders, the people in your everyday life play. And for a world that sees unimaginable levels of cruelty and cold heartedness on an everyday basis, as we all know, there is an even greater number of individuals who turn a blind eye to these recurring events. And we need a kind of an engagement that operates from a space of faith and zero tolerance about violence to any of us, you, me, or someone else if you don't know and you get to know about it later, rather than a space which connects what is someone in my family is meant. If that's the space, the, if fear is the space you operate from, we need something stronger to believe. And um, as much as uh, the implications of the word stakeholder, extends in investments, money, share, business, and uh, the people in the position of power, people in the position of uh, decision-making on a global level, in, in, through international organizations, through the government, everything. It's more important to delay stakeholder with the word support. And it's inevitable that we begin, we ourselves begin to pursue the meaning of stakeholder on a more humanistic level, because it will, I assure you, it will help uh, view and help you perceive the concept of stakeholder engagement and the possible ways and recommendations to improve it in the private sector, be it the government, be it the nonprofits in your country or in a global level. The humanistic level of approach is very, very innovative. That being said, I do want to underscore some more tangible and actionable approaches to increase the stakeholder engagement for the cause. And when we say OGBB, the anonymity on the internet of the online uh, gender-based violence, anonymity is a deciding factor on how the recurrence or the prevalence of someone harassing you online or someone committing any form of uh, violence multiplies in unimaginable numbers. And of course, Katie and Hafsa both work in um, tech spaces and in these fields very prominently. And uh, the work they do is of course very inspiring. But with that, uh, I think we all have an idea of the kind of um, uh, violence that can go online um, through uh, make tech a medium. There are there are so much, uh, so many forms, and uh, Hafsa has uh, talked to us about it. So I would like to reiterate some of those recommendations. 
uh, and take some inspiration from our very own toolkit as well. So uh, first uh, section on uh, of stakeholders, the first category of stakeholders that uh, are in abundance, I would like to focus on the government. And uh, we need gender transformative laws uh, to come from a place and operate from a place where, as Shobha rightly said, prevention is the main goal instead of uh, curing it later or punishing the offenders later. The inspiration should come from a place where you want to prevent something, where you want to make laws that actively uh, eliminate chances of uh, any kind of online, in-person, uh, in, uh, and other forms of violence happen. And uh, beginning from the government, it's, it's very safe and secure body that we can rely to and report any kind of uh, violence that has happened to us or someone with uh, someone who, or we can be licensed to people who have uh, undergone such kind of recommendation and I think uh, most people here will agree to the kind of reinforcement that we need uh, to echo for the government to take some more actionable plans. There are already many laws in place and we need severe awareness on many fronts of the society, be it uh, a rural sector or be it uh, the youth sector especially, for people to know that these laws exist and for them to um, have an agency to act on it and report the mechanic or report any kind of offense committed, even if it's online, even if it's through a complaint report. There are several laws in place, but uh, definitely we need more to implement. To uh, an, another important category, the corporate sector. And, and for this, I would like to reiterate and emphasize on the tech based needs in the private sector. Because uh, there have been recent developments about uh, engaging with and uh, advocating against uh, workplace violence or workplace harassment uh, by tech mediums, online mediums. And there are actively working uh, at least some of the uh, private sector companies. And we have kind of need that emerges to uh, have a more of agency to uh, talk your voice is breaking uh, Tanmaya. about the fight against it and to I have a little unstable internet yes, yes. connection okay but please continue yes we we have to live with all these things yes uh should I do it to Okay. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I hope I'm audible. Now. Yes, yes, better. If yes. I break in between, please let me know. Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shobha. So, after the private sector organizations and the companies, uh, my attention is on the non profit, the civil society organizations, and there is a plethora of emerging uh, organizations which are increasingly youth-led. And that is, I would like to uh, mention that here because it's a very revolutionary change that the youth is actively taking uh, control of uh, such, against such evils in many parts of the country and even on the international level. So uh, the need to echo the sentiment for prevention uh, should be uh, universal in all these sectors of stakeholders that we are talking about. 
because uh, when some when one person initiates change when one agency initiates change when a certain category of stakeholder initiates change the cycle is uh, a cycle it affects uh, the rest of the uh, sections of the society in significant ways uh, the formative pillars of society, uh, they are uh, another important pillar, an important category of stakeholder. Because when we uh, say stakeholder engagement, it has to be the people that you have access to, the people that you meet every day, the people who can start working at the grassroots level. Because a government or a private uh, sector company or a very uh, a huge net profit company can uh, begin the change, but it has to be implemented. You have to see through, and that is, uh, from uh, the it starts from the home, from your school, the university, from your community organizations, uh, your non corporate uh, cooperative societies that. You are a part of, or the uh, uh, people that you know who are working for this change. Because uh, there are, I, in my personal experience, there are instances when you have the opportunity to get involved and get engaged in uh, some initiatives, maybe on your community level, maybe on your educational level of the organization that you are enrolled in or working at. And um, often we are so busy or so uh, 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 busy or wound up in uh, the, our career advancement or the rest of the spheres that um, we are occupied with that uh, we often postpone these things. And um, that is also one call to action to the self, to every one of us that uh, sometimes postpones being involved in these things because change is uh, this is where change begins and this is where the transformation begins where people uh, begin to notice the change begin to accept it and uh, to the need to denormalize several belief systems se uh, several value systems that have been uh, wrongly normalized for they have been uh, just because it is conventional or just because it takes a lot of effort to fight against. Uh, that is the point where you just uh, put your foot down and you begin to take uh, an action on a very, very fundamental and self level. Uh, so many uh, uh, sectors of these stakeholder engagement are a crucial, crucial role in shaping our societies not just uh, the people who have faced violence or have been uh, uh, involved in uh, being a victim to any sort of violence are responsible to initiate change, but those of us who have not been, uh, fortunately and thankfully, have not been a, a victim yet or have not faced any kind of extreme violence, it is the violence in our Quote as well to because every one of us is a stakeholder in every way that I can imagine. And this is but a small glimpse of what the second edition of uh, our Youth Guide Toolkit to End OGBV entails. You can, of course, find a more detailed version and uh, several mechanisms in place, reporting mechanisms, guidelines, and resources that will help you and every one of you go through it, get a better insight to, in it. But um, for now, in this moment of time, I think we have to start somewhere. And sometimes we have to start at the same point of inception again and again to re-navigate. Uh, this is an, of course, uh, an extremely open-ended discussion. And there are vast subjectivity of perspectives and stories and experiences and a scope for suggestions and recommendations and scope for change. 
but uh, for now i think i will uh, conclude with thought that is very close to me and that has been inspired in me through the last uh, year of working with uh, un women and uh, these uh, stories of uh, motivation the work that people like kiti and hafsa and the rest of our team is doing is that uh, we often battle with categorizing ourselves trying to gauge the extent of our feminism or our liberalism or our passion for equality or empowerment that is often a battle within us to put ourselves into a certain label and i've realized that trying to put shackles on this infinite canvas of womanhood or humanity at large often deviates us from what we're supposed to do because we are spending a lot of ourselves and a lot of our time just deciding who we are and on behalf of everyone who was a part in making this toolkit uh, feasible and uh, such a genius piece of resource that it is this uh, is just not an open uh, call to action for the stakeholders uh, to uh, reach out with support or to of the support in any way that strengthens uh, the cause and strengthens the kind of uh, support uh, we have in the community within the networks and that we are a part of but this is a call to action to advocate for change ourselves and um, to start the change from a point where it uh, is not uh, you know it's completely perennial it is not going to uh, a dead end direction and even if it's a point that you have to start um, many a times you have to come back and denavigate the stakeholder engagement for uh, ending youth based gender violence or online gender based violence or uh, the violence in any form be it against young girls women or often against boys and men you have to start with yourself and have to have a very tunnel kind of an approach to stay focused on what you are supposed to do what we are supposed to do as a community as a, a you know team and um, continue to uh, increase the awareness so yeah that's my thank time you. thank you very much thank you thank you hafsa kirti and tanmaya for you are very very valuable and pertinent inputs and for making this session so lively informative and empowering at least it has empowered me a lot uh we now move on to the next session which is a panel discussion with feminist leaders in the media space from across the region we have with us today kalpana acharya sari jalil rita vidyadana and zavonia viera Kalpana is a senior journalist and editor from Nepal who serves as editor in chief of Health TV online. She has been the past president of Nepal Health Journalists Association. She is also on the board of Global AMR Media Alliance and Asia Pacific Media Alliance for Health and Development. Zari is a senior journalist from Pakistan. She is editor of Voice PK the first human rights digital news platform of pakistan rita vidyadana is a senior journalist from indonesia who has earlier served as editor of the jakarta post currently she is on the board of global amr media alliance as well as on the board of asia pacific media alliance for health and development bonia is a senior journalist from timor leste who serves as chief editor of neon metin media in delhi and also as president of timor leste journalists association she is also on the board of global amr media alliance welcome to all four of you my question to you is to what extent is online gender based violence a problem in your country how does it impact media and what can media do to curb it we will begin with kalpana So over to you, Kalpana. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Soba, for a wonderful space. Ah, uh, yes, uh, as you said earlier, internet and digital uh, platform brought 
numerous positive changes and opportunities. Along this, uh, it has so many challenges and we have uh, so many negative aspects too. Uh, for example, I, ju I just want to share uh, online gender-based violence is increasing day by day globally, particularly in terms of online harassment, cyberbullying, body shaming, trolling, various forms of violence targeting individual based on their uh, gender. Uh, as you said, uh, in the context of Nepal, like in many countries, uh, the increase in uh, internet access and the use of social media platforms contribute to the rise in uh, online gender-based violence. Um, I just want to uh, share 90% of the uh, population has access to uh, the internet in Nepal. Uh, so uh, uh, online violence also increasing. Uh, it has become easy for people uh, with ill intention to post rude comments um, or uh, send unwanted messages, unnecessary images, videos, especially to women and girls. Uh, here, uh, Sobha, I just uh, want to share one study research uh, there was a study in 2022 uh, in Nepal, a study entitled Online Violence Against Women Journalists. It is related to women journalists. That's why uh, I want to share here. This study has uh, revealed that 88.6% of women journalists that took part in the survey reported that they have been subjected to online violence. Um, although this is a small survey report, 500 women journalists are involved in uh, this uh, survey report, but this is uh, very crucial, very important uh, report. It reflects the uh, online violence uh, in media fraternity. So uh, according to this research, uh, Facebook Messenger is the main platform used to unleash online violence. 62.3% uh, respondents said they are subjected to online violence through Facebook Messenger. So Facebook Messenger is the main uh, platform. Uh, likewise, 15.3% uh, blame Twitter, 12.8% uh, WhatsApp, 11.7% Viber, 6% email, and 4.6% Instagram. This is the uh, scenario. And likewise, 62.3% uh, respondents answered that online violence had an impact on their mental health. This is a recent uh, research and 14.3% of women journalists wanted to quit journalism due to online violence. So uh, this is very uh, scary uh, data for us, for uh, media people, especially women journalists. Uh, and uh, this research, um, I think this research uh, reflects that online violence exists in all professions and uh, in all fields, as even empowered women, uh, like uh, women journalists who work to expose uh, wrongdoings uh, are equally vulnerable to online violence. This is uh, one uh, reflection, this is the report. And another thing is, um, as you uh, mentioned, um, the second part, how uh, media can play to minimize the online violence, uh, especially uh, to journalists or women journalists. Uh, what we can do is, um, first of all, there should be a digital literacy. As um, earlier, my colleague said that, there should be digital literacy um, to the young people who really um, more engaged in the uh, online platforms. So um, I have noted some points what media can do. Uh, number one is uh, media plays a crucial role in uh, curbing gender-based online violence by shaping public perception, fostering awareness and advocating for the change. Number two is uh, media can use their platform to raise awareness about the prevalence and impact of online gender-based violence through news reports, articles, they can highlight rules and regulations of their countries. 
And number third is uh, media can initiate education or educational campaign to promote digital literacy and responsible online behavior. And number four is uh, media can advocate for strong legal framework because when uh, somebody is uh, uh, harming uh, through online um, uh, violence, so where to go? They don't know where to go and where to report. Even uh, though there is law, uh, we have Le Electronic Transaction Act, we have cyber law, but uh, they uh, don't know how to go and where to go and where to report. That's why um, media can advocate for the strong legal framework and policies addressing gender-based violence. Uh, thus, uh, we can utilizing our influential uh, media platform, we can create a safer and more respectful online space uh, for all. Uh, so uh, I just want to share this uh, message and I want to stop here. If there is any queries, any questions, I love to uh, reply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalpana. And thank you for bringing up the point that online violence is spilling over into the real space and into the offline space. As you mentioned, and this is uh, this is actually a sad reality that women, even women journalists and other women, uh, Kirti had also mentioned that they have even quit their jobs or were on the verge thought of quitting their jobs because of the harassment they were facing. Uh, thank you for bringing up that point. Uh, now, can I invite Rita Vidyadana from Indonesia to please share her thoughts? Thank you, Soba. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you. So honored to be with uh, you all and uh, especially uh, with uh, listening to uh, our uh, brilliant young leaders who provide us with insightful uh, new types of various forms of OGBV, which is uh, inspiring and uh, really for we can call ourselves as senior journalists, but this is new for us and we have to keep learning, keep uh, on daily basis because uh, OGBV changes every second maybe. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, as also uh, Kalpana said that we in the, uh, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, we have seen a uh, surge in cases of online uh, OGBV in the last few years. And uh, in, in, the, in case of Indonesia, we have seen 300% increase in OGBV since nine, uh, 2021. And uh, they occurred in various uh, social media platform uh, so in Indonesia, uh, around uh, two, 212 million of population uh, can access to internet and they, the number of Facebook users are 119.9 million, 49% of users are female. Uh, YouTube users is 139 million, Instagram 91.77 million people, 50% are girls and female uh, users. But unfortunately, unlike uh, Kirti said that most of them do not have luxury and knowledge to learn more about their, the social media platforms they are in. And therefore they are vulnerable to any forms of OGBV in the last few years. So uh, Indonesia actually has already issued various uh, programs to protect girls and women against OGBV such as SafeNet, Perempuan Aman Internet, uh, how to use internet safely for women and other program. And the Indonesian government has also issued laws uh, 
the law of information elect and electronic transaction, which guarantee the rights to protect personal data. However, there are no close uh, regulation that specifically protect victims of sexual violence in cyber face, cyberspace. And therefore, the weak protection of personal data has led to various forms of OGBV in the last few years. And also, uh, Indonesia has just issued law number 12 on sexual violence. But this law needs revising because there is no uh, OGBV cases uh, specifically included in the law. And we need to revise them in order uh, to comply with the international on human rights. And similarly in Indonesia, like in Nepal, the Indonesian female journalists also face various uh, threats and uh, experiencing gender-based violence while carrying out their journalist duty. Uh, there is a survey in October 2021 about 85.7 uh, journalists respondents has, has experienced violence during their journalistic career. Uh, they both experience offline and online. This is uh, very uh, scary for us. Media, of course, uh, have been playing uh, important roles in educating the public on a GBV on, uh, by producing ethical. But uh, the media people has also uh, continued to uh, improve their capacity building on how to report on OGBV because uh, OGBV is uh, emerging every day. So we need to uh, upgrade, uh, improve the knowledge in order to do the right things to write about OGBV cases and to educate our audience. And also media advocacy strategy should also ta target media outlets by encouraging editors, chief editors and media owners to take stands against OGBV and generate unbiased contents on the issue. Not all editors, chief editors understand what is uh, OGBV. So we need to uh, educate them also within our organization. So before we educating uh, our audience, we need to uh, strengthen our organization in order to take strong stance against OGBV. And therefore, we need to uh, collaborate closely to encourage our editors, chief editor, and that this is important issue. And also the media can also become of influential um, power to uh, push forward policy to the government to implement, to, inf to enforce the law, and also to educate uh, the, uh, the users in order to do, uh, to use me social media uh, platform safely. So, uh, but at the same time, Indonesia also struggling with their own problem, protecting journalists, especially female journalists against various forms of offline and online violence. So we need uh, all uh, stakeholders, like uh, the young leader said that we need to do, uh, to work together with the National Commission and the Indonesian Press Council, uh, as well as other stakeholder to provide guidelines for the protections of uh, journalists as well as women and girls in how to uh, use the social media platform safely. I think this is uh, our share from Indonesia. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much. And from Indonesia, we now move on to Timor Leste. Uh, Vanya, would you please share your thoughts and your insights? 
So, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to uh, part of this Zoom. I hope you listen to So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Timor Leste is part of the Soviet Asia. So, we have a very strong patriarchal system in Timor. That how the men have more stronger uh, decision making in every sector that we have. So, in, of course, including in the the media uh, platform, how the the dominate by the men in in each institution that uh, I mean for the, uh, for media institutions. So every 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 reporting every every news that covers like is, we have gender bias uh, issue. I mean. No, they don't have the gender sensitive issue. So, re regarding to the online gender based violence, is uh, now we are in digital era. So, it's really hard in Timor Leste because uh, we got a lot of uh, cyber bullying, hate speech, and harassment, uh, especially for the to the vulnerable group, uh, the girls, uh, people with disability, and also LGBTI community. So this is the the vulnerable groups that uh, get a lot of uh, the the neg ne negative uh, action from the people that using social media. So uh, even that we have a lot, we have the ranking one, the very good index uh, in terms of the freedom of express and uh, the press and expression in Southeast Asia. We are ranking one, and in the global we are on top ten. Uh, to express our 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 opinion, our one, then because we have very very good index on expression, so the old people can using their their expression to to bullying, uh, you know, uh, the the women and uh, LGBTS community more target uh, for those people to doing every every day they they see that uh, they become become subject. Object in, in in their in their things in social media. So the, because of also lack of uh, digital literacy and how the the the, the the people, especially the youth, using internet uh, as a health internet, like we call internet saudable, like how the healthy internet can be more responsible. To using so regarding to our report that uh, we work with Oxfam in Timor Leste and also the aviation that uh, we do focus group discussion online with the people that we act, uh, I mean uh, with people uh, LGBTI people disability young influencer that that using social media they they become more targets. And no uh, now I mean not safer to using social media. Uh, how 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 they can see the big problem, and then there's a young journalists because they don't have to understand more. what is the sensitive journalist, what is sensitive journalist reporting to to doing advocacy. We know that the media is very important how to do advocacy, not only to to press story that can politicians. From society, but the how you can become stakeholder with uh, the human rights defenders and also increase the knowledge about the the human rights because when you talk about the the human rights is including the women's people with disability LGBTI all people that have same right in 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 our society in in our country now. We have this draft of cybercrime law that are uh, pending, and but we try to doing protest to not, uh, I mean, to not the government not to approve the draft because it's the cybercrime that that really really belong to the politicians people and political party, not for all people that more have like more need this uh, to uh, more secure on their life. So in uh, so we try to. Uh, Influencing, I mean, approach our government how to more uh, to have this uh, the the draft uh, the law that more gives secure to the people's disability, LGBTI or journalists to more safety using the online. So now, journalist Timor 
Cancer Journalists Association working with like uh, our donors and press council in Timor Leste and Ombudsman uh, in, in Timor Leste to doing uh, digital literacy to the young people, and the domestic workers, because they have right how to prevent, protect themselves when they're using social media uh, against uh, the, the uh, online sexual harassment or cyberbullying uh, that can affect it by the psychology. So you're doing uh, training, uh, workshop on digital security, how to use in social media more secure, like with a platform or with with application that they can more secure, like how to introduce the signals, the signals to them, to use the signal for the journalists how to use the signal uh, in their uh, the rule and how uh, how uh, to, to 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 explain about the how the WhatsApp not really secure for us now because uh, how the people they can use in WhatsApp to to uh, to identify our data privacy application of the the social media platform to to those people to understand how to more secure using 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 uh, the 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 social media uh, as a Facebook and and, and WhatsApp in Timor Leste. So and uh, and you do a recommendation for our government in regarding to our our research that you have done before. So because uh, how you can uh, collaborate with the government to to talking about more uh, uh, about the digital rights. So I think because, sorry my Hello? Hello, yes, yes. Your voice is breaking in between. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I have problem with... Yes, there is some internet problem, I think. Okay. Yes, there is some internet problem. Yes, there is some internet problem. Yes, there is some All right. Thank uh, you. So, yes. So we we doing advocacy in promoting... Uh, we, we, we are doing advocacy in promoting... Uh, you promoting digital writing, uh, digital writing, digital writing, introducing, introducing, introducing. Bonia, your voice is echoing, and we can't hear you properly. It's echoing, so maybe there is an internet issue. So thank you very much for your very very valuable inputs and what you said. <laughs> Uh, sorry for my sorry for my uh, for my uh, for my uh, your voice is echoing uh, your voice is echoing your voice is hello hello yes now it's better Yes, now it's perfect. But right now it was all echoing. We couldn't understand anything. Yes, you can start. You can uh, just finish off what you were trying to say, please. Yes. Uh, okay. So now you're promoting uh, digital rights in, in Timor Leste, mm -hmm. uh, working with the human rights defenders, ombudsmen, and government to introduce about the digital rights. Digital rights, including how to respect uh, uh, the freedom of the press and expression, and how to combating. I mean, to minimize, to reduce the online sexual. Uh, sexual online gender sexual harassment uh, in social media so you introducing how to uh, to people to understand uh, digital rights uh, to using and then how to against uh, online sexual harassment in, in in social media and also uh, we provide more training for the young journalists to understand more gender sensitive reporting to doing advocacy uh, on on uh, on about the impact of uh, uh, the sexual abuse to the victims and also how to approach the government to have more uh, the law that make more uh, the young women and girls to more secure uh, on, on, on online. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bonia. Uh, and uh, you made a very good point. I, and I think all of us need to remember that freedom of speech is, yes, very necessary. And, but we should not forget that my freedom ends 
where someone else's begins. And that is an important crux of the problem because it's our freedom we think of at the cost of so many other people's freedom. So thank you, Kalpana, Rita, and Vonya. I think Zari has not been able to make it for some reason. So thank you, Kalpana, Rita, Vonya, again for highlighting media's role in the fight against OGBV. We now move on to the third and last session of the day. I invite peer youth leaders to share their reflections and insights on this important issue. And in the interest of time, please keep them short. Because as Dr. Shoemaker has said, small is beautiful indeed. If you ever get hold of that book, please do read it. It's a wonderful book on economics. So now I would first re uh, request S.M. Shakat, who leads Serat Bangladesh, a youth-focused organization that is a home for young change makers who dream to make their ideas for social justice and equality into realities. Over to you, Shekhar. Uh, am I audible? Very audible. Let me check my mic. Thank you so much, Shobha, and, um, and all the previous speakers and uh, the audience here today. Uh, good afternoon and morning, based on where you are. Uh, and of course, a happy new year. Um, so the discussions that we have been uh, uh, up to, uh, hearing up to until now, was more about the challenges and how different aspects of the solutions that we could put it in, uh, put to stop it and, uh, uh, you know, challenge the challenges. Uh, so one of the things uh, during the work uh, 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 that we have identified or been facing, uh, that what are the most ignorant, you know, spectacular issues uh, around on online gender-based violence is interestingly the misunderstanding or lack of understanding of the of this particular gender-based violence area. So just to give you an example that uh, Bangladesh uh, enacted the first law to prevent gender-based violence and to uh, uh, put stop to many of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual harassments and uh, uh, crimes against women and girls back in early 2000. However, uh, the country had to take take a long way to to think about uh, some sort of a digital or cyber security uh, spaces to be included in uh, any of the legal framework up until 2018. Uh, so when the Digital Security Act came in force, it was more criticized for becoming a political instrument rather than we as social workers and and the community workers, we had to look at in, in a different way. Is it working for um, women and girls? Is it working for gender-based violence prevention? Is it working for prevent of uh, the, the new and emerging crimes that most people do not understand? Um, but I would say that the law, while it was even uh, you know revised in last year, 2023, uh, but it gave more points to the political face of the online security issues rather than leaving and also left a, a very relatively, um, you know, uh, less priority room for online gender-based violence. Why I'm making this point uh, of, you know, bringing an example for a national uh, legal framework is because we need to understand that the legal framework is led by people, the policymakers and decision makers, they might not understand the the importance or the uh, terminologies or the issues that the on, online gender-based violence uh, can entail, which uh, um, which my colleagues uh, uh, mentioned in the in the presentation and and during the the past panels. So, if we just take on this issue and understand that how we can uh, you know engage the policymakers, make them understand this is important as important is its uh, political or other issues uh what a digital or cyber security law could support and then it comes the governance mechanism which the young people also are interested but at the same time are mostly ignorant that the internet governance system how it works what it serves and how it can be of benefit benefit to the community especially young people for example, the most young people today 
uh, and the, and the online spaces, especially social media, they've been using artificial intelligence tools uh, for uh, making profile pictures and making a lot of, you know, um, uh, you know, interesting avatars and other things. But while even they are making some graphic designs and other, you know, like useful, um, you know, uh, use of all these tools. But at the same time, we just need to make sure that the internet governance tools, the mechanism has to be, you know, uh, coherent and connected with all this advancement of artificial intelligence and keeping also keeping an open eye uh, on the dark spots or like the dark sides of, of the digital tools. So just, uh, just to understand, if you see that the deep fake, which we often see that the deep fake is being used to uh, make, uh, you know, impersonate a person, um, uh, a, a political person, it could be anyone. So it's not like it has to be someone important, it has to be a you know, film star, it has to be someone very popular. It can be anyone. So this is the point that online gender-based violence is universal and it is global. So we actually, it requires a very stringent action and, and a very focused uh, plan to, to how to combat those. And the plans come from the, you know, uh, regulatory bodies. So how we can do that? This is very important because if we look at this, you know, how UN Women wanted this to be to end it, and it wanted a, a lot of cooperation, you know, in between uh, sectors like private and public, uh, civil society, and others. While we also need to understand the digital divide, which makes girls and women and other. Um, in the communities of gender diverse communities, uh, uh, mostly at risk of, uh, you know, gender based violence because they, uh, they because their their access to internet, their access to uh, digital uh, tools are very limited. While they're doing it, sometimes it is also, you know, we just we just need to understand that while people have limited access, uh, how could they be more aware of the, you know, benefits or like how could they be aware of the harms? So this is really very important that the awareness is a tool. If we see that the awareness is very blur, you know, airy kind of word sometimes, then why would need an awareness? So I just always, uh, you know, recall and like uh, reiterate one point, which is if awareness didn't work, half of the population on earth would be uh, perished uh, after COVID. So awareness worked and we had to, we learned how to clean our hands and things, just relating this to this because awareness works and we need to make our uh, the special young community so not just awareness we need to equip them with tools like the like the ones that they know that how to prevent uh, 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 how to prevent violence and how to make them safe and safer online uh, making my last point which is what the civil society can uh, act uh, for uh, for the young people and which is also very relevant because I think, Civil society has a very crucial role, and especially when, because it works with the community, and we as civil society, for example, Sarah, we work with the community in, in just an example to one of our projects. It trains up a thousand young people, uh, the young volunteers across, uh, uh, across the uh, three districts around the capital city, and making them aware and, uh, and, and equipped with tools to prevent gender-based violence. Now, the fact is, as there was lots of you know reactions from young people that how online gender violence work what is it ex exactly so we also are trying to incorporate all these tools that are available and especially the toolkit that um, i as as a proud member of the uh 30 for 2030 cohort of the young women and uh, other colleagues like tanmaya um uh, and others and we we have so, and others and we 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 we, we the intention is that we have to spread it out, but at the same time, we have to make it make it of use. So to do that, we need to adopt a multi-sectoral and holistic, and of course, right-based approach, uh, so that young people are aware, they're equipped, and they know what to do and where to, what, you know, how they can protect the rights of others as well as of themselves. I would put a stop to my myself here. Shoba, if I get if 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 you need any further you know, point to clarify, I'll be here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shekhar. And uh, please allow me to go back to the previous session because Zari is here with us. And then we will come back to this session again. And uh, just to remind you all, Zari is editor of Voice PK, 
the first human rights digital news platform of Pakistan. Now, over to you, Zari. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. This is a very important panel discussion. I've been listening since the beginning. And uh, I don't know, something must have got, gone wrong that I was kind of skipped. But anyway, uh, back to... Oh, sorry for that. Sorry but, for that, Zari. No problem. No problem. So uh, anyway, uh, let's let's get to the digital landscape in Pakistan first. Yes. I'd like to. I've got some statistics here in front of me, and I, uh, I've got these. These are from twenty twenty three. So through these statistics, I can tell you that internet users have been growing, and really fast. So in at the beginning of twenty twenty three, we had about eighty seven point thirty five million internet users. Uh, maybe these users. These are still like the number is not that high uh, if you compare it to the rest of the world, even if you compare it to our neighboring countries like India, there are, there's much more digital literacy over there, I think. But you can't deny the fact that the, the social media, use of social media is increasing and uh, also internet overall is increasing. But as one of our friends here said, there is little training in the use of uh, digital you know, use so the problem over here is now you're asking me how media, uh, what extent media is affected by uh, by these things. I would like to say that media in Pakistan, this is a different angle. I'm not going to uh, brush everyone with the same thing, but uh, media itself has been part of a lot of uh, you know negative impacts when it comes to uh, online gender-based violence in Pakistan. So I'd like to um, um, uh, give an instance of Aurat March, which happens every March 8th. It's a women's march. And uh, uh, since the past four or five years now, women, uh, as civil society, uh, women and transgenders, they have been collecting together. And uh, it's been very forceful and very assertive, this, these marches. But what our media has done, especially these independent YouTubers and uh, people who record for Facebook and everything, they come and they give a very slanted perception. In fact, slanted is a very, uh, you know, um, it's a very light word that I'm using. What uh, they they actually accuse these women, they have been accused of, uh, they've been, their characters have been tainted, they're, they're tarnished, they've gone through character assassination, they've gone through, you know, there's bad words written about them online. There have been uh, accusations of being funded from abroad, things like that. So, I mean, and these women have been fighting left, right, and center for their privacy, for their, you know, they've been trying to clarify their names. Some of them have now started to hide themselves. So these, and these, many of these women, they belong from a very privileged, you know, a part of society, many of them. Uh, I mean, you come from a privileged part of society, you're not really exposed. I mean, I wouldn't say it's not exposed, but you kind of find it easier to fight the online violence that is what i have observed as a journalist but you know because uh, they've been more educated and they've been more exposed but now they've been trying to hide themselves also now they're like they, they wear masks when they come online they don't disclose their names they've been taking precautions when they start to prep for Aurat march uh, for women's march they don't give out what they're doing all the activities are this is just one aspect of the society that i'm trying to tell you in pakistan that media has really, the journalists, so-called journalists, have really ruined it for women. Then there are other examples. This is a major case study in Pakistan. Then there are other examples within the media itself. Women journalists, they are being harassed. Uh, we have formed a union kind of a thing. It's a, a women's journalist union. And we, we kind of bring out press releases and we make statements because up till now, all our press clubs, all our unions, they have been completely male dominated. So word of the word of women journalists, that doesn't get out, get out uh, exclusively. We want our word to get out exclusively. So that's one way that we've been fighting these online accusations and, you know, character assassinations against us. And, and many of us, like more than 80%, 90%, in fact, any woman you talk to, they have been targets of some kind of online gender-based violence whether it's, you know, revenge porn, whether it's just, you know, messages from in the inbox, they have been victims of it. So this is the situation. And then uh, we, we worked in this documentary, Voice Speaking, my, my own web channel. We worked in this documentary, which highlighted gender-based violence, actually. And we came across this case study where an ordinary woman, she was 
her um, she was a victim of revenge porn and ultimately she ended up killing herself leaving her three four children behind so this is also i mean these cases are now increasing because because there are uh, this is not common but now it's happening also so you know this is a very dire situation and there's nothing to protect them uh, there's nothing to protect people from this kind of thing we've come up with laws and acts like uh, pakistan act pika it's called p e c a but that act also has some kind of consequences which are detrimental to your freedom of expression so you see when you when the government starts blocking you or arresting you on small or minor charges then there is a very there's a very vague definition of what's right and what's wrong in the gray areas and then everything suddenly becomes also blasphemy uh, the, there's a huge human cry over that so you know and even saying anything online suddenly becomes a crime so we need to as media work on those areas a lot we need to come out with what's black and white what is a crime what is not and then work on those things as for uh, civil society and ngos and organizations uh, we have a very, very good org- we have uh, actually three or four organizations that are working on digital rights and privacy so they are doing some excellent work digital rights foundation uh, is a leading organization it has pu- reports research reports publications and uh, also it's, it's got this helpline which encourages you to call if there's a problem uh from the government side we have the federal investigation agency the fia uh, which does actually poses to take in your complaint sometimes there are obviously then again it's a male dominated department so there are issues uh, there have been issues in the past where uh, you know you complain about certain problems online gender based violence and and they don't take your complaint in or they don't arrest the person you know and they say we are monitoring department more than an execution uh, operations department so th- th- these are the problems that we are facing and uh, members of the media have to work not only have to work their way around this but they have to also be like uh, sometimes be targets of this so this is in short the situation over here in my country thank you very much zari thank you we had you at last because <laughs> you have made some very very important observations and thank we you. go back thank you and we go back to our youth leaders uh i now invite tanya khera from samanta foundation india that works with rural tribal and forest communities in remote hilly areas on youth engagement to develop local leadership and initiatives over to you tanya is tanya there yeah yes yeah 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 well, am i audible yes very audible yeah thank you so much so hi everyone i am tanya and this shobha for the wonderful introduction and thank you everyone for uh, such insightful experiences so uh, without taking much time i just say that when i got to know that i have to share my views on online gender based violence so the first report i referred to was the national crime report bureau and i was amazed by the numbers so first number that i would like to share is that uh, in india in the year 2020 there were around 50035 cases registered for cyber crime and in the year 2022 that cases reached from 50000 to somewhere around 66000 so that's almost 30% increase now diving deep into the same numbers when i looked at the there was a table which explained about what are the motives behind such such cases so out of these the highest ranking uh, was given to sexual exploitation with 3434 cases which are around sexual exploitation and fake news cyber, cyber blackmailing being at 696 so the numbers are even not near to sexual harassment and then again looking at the numbers of those states so in from the most developed states like maharashtra to the most underdeveloped like uttar pradesh they were leading in numbers so here the point i would like to make is that tech tech based violence or exploitation online things they do not come with a tag that okay these cases are going to happen in the developed areas because people do have access to technology people in the rural and the remote geographies also have access to the technology in the kind of content these people are looking at is much beyond rationality and logic 
so the, in the areas where i work i work with young girls and uh, boys as well so the kind of exploitation happens on whatsapp also like so i am walking somebody will click my picture and then they can what they look for boys will do in the local area they will put my photo and then they'll fudge it in a video with another boy and maybe the video is like i'm walking hand in hand with that guy and there's some music playing so certain cases come to us also where girls complain that okay these are the problems and then the end result is that this causes problem for them in getting married or the mobility of girls moving out so this is the impact of technology in the online harassment at the remotest of the areas and cyber crime against women the numbers are huge we all know as everybody mentioned about everything what what goes on we have also experienced certain calls messages certain things so i believe that um, the major cause is that the access to the smartphones is with the men in the community the females use phones of their fathers or their husbands so that becomes the problem because i as a female do not know what the other person is doing but my brother might know because he must have seen my video at his one of his friends whatsapp group so this is the intensity and the saddest part in these numbers is that in india being the highest in the population the number of cases reported you won't believe in the year 2022 the cyber crime against women the number of cases reported are just 14500 and the numbers tell that the cases are not even reported so i think we really need to work around uh, awareness and like i would not like to repeat what others said but i just wanted to bring light on these numbers and the impact of technology in the uh, remotest because i work with the forest communities and here also i see how girls and even people from lgbtq communities also go through such exploitation online thank you thank you very much sanya and you have rightly said that cases are under reported i think due to not being aware and also because of that label of shame which is an accusation which is associated with it that it is always the survivor or the i won't call the girl the victim the survivor who is going to bear the brunt of it so very often i think that is also one of the reasons for not reporting the case and of course many of us don't know where to report and how to report thank you for that intervention and now i invite joshua delaver national coordinator at y peer pakistan y peer stands for youth peer education network which is a global initiative that empowers young people to empower each other over to you joshua hi everyone am i audible am i yes. visible not visible but audible yes let me just audible very well yes oh. yes now perfect yeah. hi everyone good afternoon and uh this is joshua delaver from pakistan uh thank you so much ms shobha and uh, cns for organizing uh this great event and inviting me over and i've been listening to the session since the beginning and it was so informative and so so inspiring um i would appreciate all the panelists who have done great and remarkable work in the field and um, considering the time i want to repeat the things which have already been discussed and majority of the things which i wanted to discuss on the basis of pakistan has been highlighted by zari uh, so the thing is that the thing i would like to emphasize is meaningful youth engagement to end online gender based violence and male engagement as much as possible and along with that i would like to highlight the topic and point of uh, the discrimination which trans women faces online uh, because that 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 came into my mind because recently uh, my friend who is a trans woman is electing for the very first time she's electing uh, uh, elections in pakistan for the seat of national assembly and that's a big thing and she has been facing a lot of discrimination and you know uh, online hatred and bullying and you know doxing a lot of things just because of she's a transgender and she's elect, uh, electing for the national assembly so just like this people are not and not sensitized and they think that online commenting and online uh posting it's it doesn't matters but i have 
heard and I have met a lot of people who have been, uh, you know, uh, who have who faced a lot of challenges just because of online bullying and online challenges, right? Mental health affects a lot. If 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 we you know uh, if we consider one person, you know, um, I still remember that one. Uh, there was a lady, and um, uh, it was she was from our team member, and she reached out to us that someone hacked her account. And uh, that person is posting, uh, you know, un, uh, appropriate pictures and, you know, X, Y, Z. And she was so tensed and she literally had a lot of mental health challenges and she went to uh, some swear condition. So sometimes I would, I'm, I'm a guy, but I would say that sometimes we, the males, we don't consider the health. Health of women and other aspects, we just do what we want. But I think male sensitization is so important, you know. And as Miss Kalpana was saying, this is the mentality from online, it happens to offline. But I would also say that off it also happens from offline to online because those are the practices these people have already been practicing at home, in streets, at uh, in their community, in their society, which they feel that they are very powerful, they are very superior, and they can do whatever they want to right so that mentality should be challenged and should be uh you know changed and that's that's the thing we, that's why we have to engage the society and we have to conduct community activism and awareness programs a lot particularly with the young people and the male ones in pakistan we do have as azari also mentioned we do have a prevention of electronic crimes act fortunately they do act uh, appropriately and they do consider the application very uh, seriously and uh, and according to the recent according to the recent report of digital rights foundation they literally received more than uh, like 3000 cases in one in like 12 months a few years a few years back they uh, launched the report but the thing is that um, how the government and how the department are considering resolving the cases they do but still the mental health of that person affects right and uh, Government is considering the online gender-based violence, but still they are not sensitized enough how, uh, you know, the people who are getting the application and people who step in the step at the doors of the department to, uh, you know, file the application, those people are not sensitized enough as well. I want to, uh, you know, put this flag as well because those people should be sensitized as well. And um, um, at the closing time and i would just recommend two two three solutions to strengthening strengthening the legal frameworks and digital literacy programs civil society organizations and governments are working on the empowering women and you know uh, for the innovative solutions and uh, uh, digital solutions but they should also be considering their their literacy and uh, digital literacy and they they should know what are the laws and uh, how to protect themselves because uh, uh, civil society organizations are working at grassroots level in small villages at universities to enable girls young girls and women to start their online businesses uh, in the digital era but they are not sensitized enough to protect themselves from the online things and the last thing as someone also mentioned that reports uh, people do not report first of all and second we have uh, very less research and evidence-based data on this so yeah thank you so very much Thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, I would request Marcha Pornil, who's here. She's from Thailand, and she's a feminist human rights defender and uh, 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 development justice rights activist. Uh, Marcha, would you like to say a few words, please? Um, thank you, Shobha. Um, I was uh, surprised that you invited, but I have been listening uh, all of the um, necessary information and situation that's faced by the young people in our regions. Um, since three years, my organization has been working on media literacy, and we were involved with the indigenous young people, um, and we conduct uh, media literacy training for the young people. Uh, in order to do that, we also uh, working on assessment of what the risk that the indigenous young people uh, face, it, especially uh, for high school students. 
with actually, you know, um, during the COVID-19, our students forced to involve the online platform when the educations uh, do not providing necessary um, tools for them to be safe in online. Um, we found after the online end, uh, a lot of students addict to uh, 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 games. Uh, many of them are uh, order something online and they pay, but they couldn't get anything um, because there are a lot of um, scam in the uh, in the platform and the platform do not respond to that uh, other issue that everyone talking about is that um, online threatening or online bullying as well as online harassment is not only limitation to young people, it's not only happen to uh, uh, human rights defenders, but also happen to anyone who are involved in online if they are um, um, vulnerable because of their identities, uh, especially um, in our uh, context where indigenous communities still lack of uh, acknowledgement of uh, gender diversity and sexual orientation, uh, meaning that they have two levels of vulnerability, one hand is on, you know, being young indigenous people. On the other hand, also in the section with, you know, being sexual minority, and that's made them face it. What we are um, can imagine, you know, a lot of bullying happen, a lot of um, uh, sexual harassment also happen online. These not new things in our society is already acknowledged. And if we kind of searching in the research, we found that the other level that we need to do is how we can pushing our education system to have uh, create, to create the, um, the curriculum that meant to be or that need to be addressed these situations, meaning that even teacher, you know, uh, 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 educator also lack of the tool, you know, for themselves. Uh, but then, how can they translations good practice into their students? So I think that need to uh, working on a, a systematic change, which actually uh, involve um, the law and policy, which also need to protect it, you know, all the shy and students and youths. Uh, the other issue that we found during our research is that um, the, the platform itself is don't have uh, any kind of law and policy that, you know, uh, that uh, holding their accountable to this when it's happened in that platform. Um, and they benefit so much from our information and our privacy. And that's why we are now pushing for feminist internet, which actually um, need to be, um, you know, advocates and need to be implemented at all level. So I think I would like to address two of um, very important information. And thank you. I hope this platform will continue and see how we can implement it into the community level. Thank you, Choba. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I wish we could have continued with the discussion, uh, but uh, already we have overshot the time by 30 minutes. But this is this should not stop here. We should meet again. And before I just say a few closing remarks, I would like to read a comment uh, from Saroj Tamang from Nepal. And Saroj says that this session is so helpful, especially for LBGTIQ communities. They face Online bullying, harassment, and blackmailing a lot. They don't openly come out and speak or report about these violent acts as there is no strong cyber crime law in Nepal. And they have to go through this every day and live like a helpless person. And I think this thing has been brought up earlier also by one of our speakers. So with this, we come to the close of today's session on youth and online gender-based violence challenges and solutions. Thank you speakers for not only putting the spotlight on the problem, but also for raising 
anger and hope inside us to put an end to it. And special thanks to the participants for their patience, attention, and active involvement. We have to raise awareness and foster participation and meaningful engagement of all, especially the young people from all walks of life, including those from underrepresented and underprivileged groups in all our initiatives. We have to ensure that each and every person stops violating others and maintains a respectful and safe online space for everyone. Now, I before ending, I'm asking you a question and then let us create a Zoom storm. Just type in your answer in the chat box. My question is, can all of us resolve to contribute in whatever way we possibly can to break down gender barriers and drive positive change for a gender equal world that is free from all kinds of violence? Can all of us resolve to do that? Please type in your response in the chat box. Quickly. Fast, fast enough. And thank you once again for your participation. Goodbye for now. Stay safe, stay healthy till we meet again. And I sincerely hope we meet again on this issue. Thank you. Namaste.